Hello. In my last video, we took a look at this board that I just received from JLPCB. It's a development board for the STM32G01 um, series of MCUs. That's the new the new G G zeros, which are a replacement for the F zeros, or perhaps complementary. But I mean, they're being marketed as the next big thing um, by by ST, and they're actually pretty good. So I thought I'd build a development board around it. Um, and I think I signed off, I remember signing off saying, I'm going to go and build it now. So uh, build it, I did. And here it is. And while it looks rather good, there is a fault with it. Um, most of it works. The, the um, MCU is fine. All of the, all of the immediate periphery around the MCU, such as the, the oscillator, the surface mount oscillator, the, uh, the 32.678 um, real-time clock, crystal is also fine, the backup checked out fine, but what didn't work was this um, this USB to serial converter up here. It's a CH340G um, and for reasons I just could not figure out, it, it just wouldn't start, it wouldn't enumerate over the USB bus. Um, it's it's figure it's fixed, it, well it's paired with a 12 megahertz oscillator here and this is a surface mount unit that I, that I bought. Uh, and no matter what I did, I couldn't get it to start up. And I'm pretty sure it was, the oscillator was the problem. Um, I was, did all kinds of probing. I know it's tough to probe an oscillator without actually stopping it from starting because you change the capacitance around it. But I think I had it about right. And I could see it trying to start and then not. And um, it would kind of sometimes enumerate and then immediately uh, disconnect. So there's clearly something wrong. And during the process of debugging, I you know, reseated the oscillator, I, repeat, I re uh, took the oscillator off, I replaced it with a new one, I replaced the CH340G with another one using hot air to get the thing off. Um, I replaced the load capacitors with slightly higher ones and slightly lower ones, nothing worked. It was really, really frustrating and took about a day of uh, debugging to get that far. So I just came to the conclusion that the CH340G, which is you know a fairly scant and documentation, it's a Chinese copy of the FTDI USB to serial um, series. It just isn't compatible with that type of oscillator. So um, I gave up, and that I thought I just I'm not going to be able to get this work. So I, I had a look around, and there's another uh, version of the CH340, the CH340E. Now the E series, as well as requiring fewer pins, and it's a smaller chip, has the, um, the oscillator on board. So it takes that risk out, out of the equation. It also means um, I, would, I would get more space on the board. And so I, I basically uh, sent off you know, my order to AliExpress to get 10 of these for the princely sum of about 30 pence each. That's about three pounds, I think it was in total. And um, in, the, in the time it took for the package to wend its way across the sea from uh, China, I also I also respun the board to put the new footprints on. So let's have a look at the new board. So before we have a look at the board itself, the physical board, let's just have a quick look at the schematic of what it is I'm actually building, so you can uh, so you kind of know what you're looking at. This is a development board for the STM32 G01 G081 RBT6. It's a new MCU from from ST, and it's it's a kind of successor, if you like, to the STM32 F0, which was very much my go-to MCU for almost every, every project I built. It was almost never the wrong answer in a project uh, that I had a, um, you know, a need for an MCU in. So naturally, when the G series showed up, I thought it's, it's worth having a look and see what they offer. Um, and they're pretty good. And I wanted to buy a dev board. And the, the problem with the, um, the current dev boards on offer is there's a fairly low spec Nucleo, which is what you expect from ST. But there's also a really expensive um, sort of high end eval board with loads of peripherals on it. And it's about $400 in the UK. So I didn't want that. And besides, I don't really like dev boards that are loaded with peripherals on board because they tend to monopolize the pins of the MCU. So you, you know you want to prototype a design of your own, and, and you find that the pins that you've designed into your um, schematic have already been taken by something on one of the, on the eval boards. You can't use them. So I decided to build a simple, cheap dev board around the uh, G081 that would have the bare minimum of peripherals on it, and would allow me uh, to get used to the chip itself and see what's on offer. So let's have a quick chat first about what the G081 um, offers. It's based on the Cortex. Um, M0 Plus uh, ARM Cortex Core. The F0 was based on the Cortex uh, M0. So this, there's just a plus on the end. So I did a bit of research into what you get for this plus sign. And basically ARM have uh, claimed yet more uh, advantages in power consumption in that it will you know, consume even, even less than before. 
Um, they've achieved that through a, through a number of different optimizations. One of which, uh, the, the headline one I, I noticed anyway, is that they've shortened the execution pipeline of the CPU from three stages to two stages. So uh, the, the execution pipeline before was, um, it was fetch, decode, execute, and that was one cycle each. And they still have the three stages. Sorry, when I said three stages, I meant uh, it reduced it to two clock cycles. They've packed those uh, those three stages, the fetch from flash, the decode of the instruction, and the execute of the, ex uh, the instruction. They've now packed it into two cycles with the decode um, overlapping, kind of like half done in the first cycle and half done in the second cycle. Have a look at ARM's website for details on that. Now that made me kind of go, hmm, is that just a marketing thing that they're claiming as an, as an advantage or is it a cost reduction? They're claiming they gain um, they gain in the power consumption area because access to flash is reduced and flash access costs power, quite a lot of power. Um, so they, they've gained there. But um, I've also noticed that the the, the M0 series in uh, the M0 Plus series from ST have now got a higher clock speed, 64 megahertz rather than 48 megahertz at the max end. And I kind of think, right, maybe they're compensating for the shorter pipeline there and the fact that we don't get as many MIPS out of the out of the core with the short pipeline. I mean, if short pipelines were a good thing, so short, you know, short pipelines and short clock cycles were a good thing, then surely Intel would be doing it with their with their desktop chips. I mean, if you look at the i7, it has something more than 20 stages in their pipeline. It's enormous. It's incredible. So, yeah, OK, they've um, gained, they've, you know, they've cut their power consumption, which we all uh, can can applaud. But I noticed that they've bumped up the uh, the maximum clock speed, perhaps to compensate. But and all, you know, on the plus side again, they've um, increased the flash memory size to 128k for this. Uh, it's really it's just the base size 128k, and the RAM is up to 36k, which I really like. That's good. You you can never have too much RAM in your MCU designs. That that's usually where you hit the limits first if you're sort of pushing the boundaries. And um, so overall, I think it's a great device and I'm going to be, I'm looking forward to working with it. So I mentioned that on my board, I didn't want to be uh, piling peripherals on that would just take away the available pins. So I'll just go through what I have got on here. Three LEDs, obvious there. Uh, you can't have a board without LEDs really. I mean, you've got to have a blinky just to make sure your thing's actually working. So that's what I have. Um, I've put in three separate power supplies up here, three separate regulators, a 3.3, a 2.5 and a 1.8 selectable via a jumper. So depending on what kind of design I'm doing, if it's just a standalone MCU, usually 3.3. If it's interfacing to an FPGA, I may want 2.5. And if I'm doing a low power design, I may want 1.8. They're all there for selectable. Um, the only other peripheral I've placed on the board is um, a USB to serial device here, the CH340E. And this one has the built-in the built-in oscillator, so I don't have to have that on the board. It comes in an MSOP 10, it's really small. Um, it's the only one, the only sort of uh, extra peripheral I put on board because you've really got to, I think I've really got to have communications back to a, you know, a major controlling device like a PC or, a, a, you know, a, a Raspberry Pi, something like that. So it's great to have one of those on board. It's connected to uh, USART 2 on PA 0, 1, 2 and 3 and it's, it's disableable by a, a jumper, you can select it. Um, I've also put jumpers on for boot selection, um, uh, power supply selection, I've already mentioned that, and I've put loads, I've, I've exposed all of the ports on headers at the side, and I've made it breadboard friendly. So the idea is that there will be a row of pins, pin headers on top, which you can use for sticking those little connector wires on, use those all the time, but there'll also be a row of uh, pin headers on the bottom, which are um, 100 mil apart and designed to plant direct, directly into, uh, into a breadboard, and the, the pins at the opposite side are a multiple of 100 mil away from the pins on the lower side, so that if you've got a very big breadboard, it would just plonk straight in. Um, something which is a bit lacking in some of the, the uh, discovery boards. I've noticed the pins there, are pinouts on there is pretty awful. And there's the ARM 20-pin uh, standard header, so I can plug it straight into my ST-Link. 20-pin header is just enormous and horrible, but it does plug directly into ST-Link, saving me some trouble. I've also put on a watch crystal, 32.768 kilohertz uh, crystal there, so I can test battery-powered battery backups and a real-time clock. Um, and there's an eight megahertz external crystal with, with, with the fact that I want, I'm doing possibly external communications and I've got UART, UART uh, connection to the uh, CH340E and the uh, UART connection to that is uh, asynchronous. It helps to have an accurate clock. The uh, built-in built high-speed oscillator inside the 
STM32s are not particularly accurate and if you bump up the baud rate, say to one or two you use are, you may end up uh, with errors if you go to particularly high rates. Much better to have a nice accurate external crystal. So I've got one of those. Right, that is that I think. Um, it's now time to go on with and look at the actual physical boards I promised about a few minutes ago. So here it is, the new board, very much like the old one, um, obviously very little difference at all. I left every, everything else um, in place except around, around here where the USB to serial converter is. Out goes that rather large SOIC, SOIC um, footprint. Let's get the old one in. That, that's the rather large SOI, SOIC footprint there. And the CH340E has a very much smaller um, MSOP10 uh, footprint there. The, it's gone to, you know, from a, something like a millimeter pitch on the other one or, or something like that. It's, it's down to a half millimeter pitch, same as the, same as the MCU. And, get, and because I had the extra space, I ditched the idea of having a custom uh, SWD connector and just went with a traditional massive, you know, hugely unnecessary sized arm. A standard 20 pin connector because I can just plug it straight into my, uh, my ST Link programmer. Uh, so there we are. Now um, I have already built it, so I don't need to break for ages here. I mean, it's been three weeks since I last built the one that doesn't work, so let's, let's get the, the new one in. And here it is. It's been through the surface mount uh, my th process. I've uh, built it in my reflow oven and I've also connected up the necessary headers to make it, uh, to make it testable. Uh, nothing else has been put in yet because at this point I just want to make sure that it, that it enumerates um, and all the devices appear as it should. I'll check out the ST link works. And if all that works, then I'll go and you know, do the laborious task of fixing all the pin headers in. So, um, what's to say about this? Now, nothing really. I've washed the board, it's, that's why it looks fairly clean. Um, the reflow process works pretty much 100, well, about 99%, I'd say. Uh, one of the one of the um, 0603 capacitors over here by the by the um, little uh, watch crystal got blown off its um, pad, so I had to manually solder that um, afterwards. The watch crystal itself was a bit squiffy. It it, it had um, it had reflowed correctly. I could see that the solder had uh, had. Uh, bound uh, to correctly to the pads at the end, but it didn't look particularly pretty. So I got my tweezers out and a hot air gun and sat it down a bit, so it looks flat on the board. It's ready to test now. I've I've used this this power jumper here where I can select three V three, two V five, or one V eight out of these three regulators. I've selected three V three. Um, this jumper here selects the CH three forty E. It'll activate it um, as long as three V three is selected. Um, if it's not on, then the 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 CH340E will not get any power, so it won't power up and it won't enumerate. And uh, the other selector here is just to say boot from flash, please, because the STM32 has a, has a choice of booting from flash or booting from SRAM in a bootloader. Now, by default, it boots from flash, which is where your design would reside. So that's all we need. Um, I'll connect it up now and hopefully we'll, we'll hear a pair of beeps. Right, I thought I might as well do this test live with you just for kicks. I'm, I'm willing to take the fall if this doesn't work. It's, um, it'll be a learning experience. So the a, uh, ST link is connected up via this great big arm cable here. This sort of ring cable goes to the ST link dongle here. Let's get that out of the way because it's just huge. And this one um, goes directly to the computer. The, neither are connected yet. So let's plug in. I'll just leave a bit of space to the left there and I'll watch what's going on using the USB view program on Windows so I can see devices get connected. And um, I'll, I'll, should, I'll make it live. I'll, I'm recording the screen here. I've got, this, I've got USB view up um, and we'll see if it works. And I'll stick it in at the side. So which one goes in first? It doesn't really matter which one goes in first, does it? Let's just put one in there. Oh, that was a beep. That was good. Where's the other one? Put the other one in. Trying to avoid my USB 3 ports because sometimes they're sometimes problematic with these devices. Stick to USB 2 if I can. Oh, and there's the other one. Excellent. I got two devices. Let's have a look at USB view. Can I see them? Yep, there's the ST Link. Ah, yes, and there's a CH340E. Fantastic. It's actually worked. Great stuff. Um, so I've got both devices showing up uh, on the on my USB ports. They're on separate hubs. Uh, I, had to, I had to just sort of scrabble around a bit there to find uh, two spare USB 2 ones. Most of my ports are USB 3. Whilst they may work on USB 3, you never know, and it's not something I wanted to be uh, uh, chancing at this stage. So that's brilliant. Um, right, now I know that the devices are actually recognised, um, 
I'll go and build the board. Uh, but first of all, actually, let me just let me just check that the ST link can be read out. So let me just fire up um, fire up the ST link programmer. One second. Reach over again. I'll I'll, fire, I'll just start the screen capture on this as well. Excellent. Right. So that's the ST link um, programming utility. And if I just go up to the menu and select connect. Yep, there it is. Brilliant. So the ST link utility was able to connect over to the um, to the chip. So not only does it enumerate, I mean that was that was good, but the um, the, the ST link I was able to talk to the STM32 and it's able to read out the device memory and see that everything's okay. So the, the, the STM32 is basically okay. Um, the SWD interface is working. So now I am really happy. Uh, I'll just go now and uh, complete the board build with all of the, the remaining through hole components and um, all those pin headers. And we'll talk about it later. Okay, back in a minute. So there it is, all completely built and ready. That's the top side. All the pin headers have been soldered into place. That took ages because I was particularly careful to make sure they all line up and they're all you know, not leaning over like you often get if you're not careful. Uh, there's a little reset button in there. The CR1220 battery is in there, which is ready to preserve the backup domain of the STM32 uh, MCU. So I can test whether that works. Everything's soldered on top and of course on the bottom, the, the Pin headers designed to slot into the breadboard are all ready. Those are all lined up perfectly. They're 100 mil apart, and the gap between here, between here and here, is a multiple of 100 mil for those that have massive breadboards. And so, really, all that remains now is me to do a quick software test. I'll fire up one of ST's development environments, and we'll write a quick program to test that the CH340E works and that the LEDs are, are all work as well. And that's enough for me to know that the board's going to be okay for me to, to do some actual real work with. So let's get on to that right now. Okay, so to test the LEDs and the CH340 USB to serial converter on my board, we're going to generate some project code here using the STM32 Cube MX software. Really easy to use piece of software. Get actually get off to a bit of a flying start when um, doing MCU development. So we're going to do access to MCU selector here. This will give me a list of everything that ST's ever created in the STM32 world. Pretty impressive piece of software, to be honest. Um, let's select our part, STM32 G081 minus the RB, there it is at the bottom, and it brings up a summary, and yes, in case you want to buy some, um, it's all the options are there, of course. So having selected it, I'll just do start project. It thinks for a bit, it's written in Java, so it may think for a while, and brings up a view of the package. So I want to firstly configure the PA0 through 3 to use USART 2. So that's the CTS pin, which won't be used, but we'll configure it anyway. RTS, uh, also not used, but put it in, TX, we need that, R RX, we need that as well. So that's the user art pin setup. Um, my LEDs are on PB13 through 15. They want to be GPIO outputs, no problem. They go green because they're going to be fully configured and used. These are still yellow because there's no configuration for them. But I'll get all the pins in first. Uh, PF0 through 1 are going to be the, the external oscillator. So PF0, OSC in and OSC out. Um, gone green because they're good, no further configuration required. We need to set up the USART because it's gone yellow. So we go to the list here, we select USART 2. Mode will be asynchronous. Um, we don't want a hardware flow control, any of that rubbish. Uh, down to the uh, board rate, 115, 200. Yes, we'll keep that, uh, but we want it, the word length to be 8. Uh, so it's basically 115, 200, 8N1 as the um, protocol. Um, and they've gone green to show that the user art is now configured uh, to use those pins. Very nice. So on to clock configuration, the next section. Big scary clock tree. Um, we need to tell it to not use the HSI because that's the default. It's enabled HSE because we've set it up in the previous screen. Um, 8 megahertz is correct, that was a good guess. Uh, HSE as the input is selected there now for the PLL. Um, if you look at this side here, you can see that the default is for 16 megahertz operation. We want to um, power this up at the full 64 megahertz, supported by the uh, the G series. So let's get this uh, the PLL multipliers set. So times eight multiplied by two isn't good. We want times 16. So eight times 16 is one to eight divided by two. You have to have a divider. One to eight divided by two is 64. And out of the PLL into the big mux here, the system clock mux, we want the PLL clock to be the uh, selected output from that MUX. And now look at this, 64 all the way through, all the peripherals and the H clock as well. So we're good. Um, no more clock messing around required. 
We'll go project manager so we can get some code generated. I'm going to call this STM32. Did I type that? No, I didn't. That's STM32 G081 test. <laughs> test. That's good. And I'll put it in my usual source folder. Application structure is basic, and that's the right directory. And we want the SW4 STM32 uh, toolchain. It's um, the one I use. It's a free and open source toolchain based on Eclipse using the ARM GCC compilers. I like it, it's very nice. All the rest of this is correct. So we just need to go generate code. A quick, uh, quick look over again before I mess something up. Yeah, it's all good. So generate code, thinks for a bit. Da, 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 da. Generates the project, all nice and quick. Now we don't want to browse or anything like that. We'll just go straight to the IDE, close that. And we're done with, um, we were done with the cube software. So I'll move that out of the way. And I've already opened up the uh, ST, SW4 STM32 IDE because it takes a while and there it is. Right, so this is the SW4S TM32 IDE, open and ready to open a, open a new project. So let's get on with that. Do file, open projects from file system. And I should just be able to paste in the directory. And there it's found the file, which is good. And we'll just do finish and it should import the project. It has done. There it is. There's the source code generated by ST. Let's have a look at the main. So open up the main. There's the auto-generated stuff. Auto-generated code here is not too bad. I mean, I have a pretty fairly pretty low expectation of the quality of auto-gen code, but they've done quite well here. The comments here that tell you where to put your own code is so that you doesn't, it doesn't get overwritten if you go back to the cube software and regenerate the, um, regenerate the auto-generated stuff, say if you change your pinout to add a new peripheral. Uh, trust that if you like, I don't really, and I tend to put very little um, of my own code in the um, auto-gen stuff and just call out to my own files. But for this, uh, for the purposes of this demo, I'm just going to paste in some code here to exercise the LEDs and and the use art. So what have we got here? We've got um, a toggle of an LED pin, a delay, toggle, a delay, toggle, delay. So we should get a cycling of the LEDs. And after the delay, we transmit 13 bytes, hello world, including um, the line terminator to the use art, delay for a further 400 millis and go back to the, go back and do it all over again forever. So in, it's basically a cycle of one second during which the LEDs will flash and we'll get something out of the use art, hopefully. So save that. Um, let's give it a compile, control B. I press the right one, I hope I did. Let's look at the output. Why is it not doing anything? Build. Build projects. Let's try again. Ah, that's better. I don't know what I pressed before. All right, so that's good. Um, let's upload it and run it. So the MCU is the MCU board is connected up correctly, and the ST link is also connected. I went through the pain earlier on of um, sorting out the CH340 drivers for Windows, and they're finally there. This wasn't easy. I had to download the driver package from. Uh, it's a third party place on GitHub actually where the driver had been expanded to its file so I could see what was inside it and I had to edit the inf file of the driver to include the um, vendor ID and uh, product ID unique to the CH340 because it was different to the ones that were in the package that was not fun but now now that the uh, vid and pid are all set up the driver was recognized and I got an extra port there so that's good all right so um, let's let's upload I'll just press F11 here which means run last um, and it should switch me to debug mode. It has done, that's good. And the default settings for a new debug configuration is to jump straight in and break at main, which it has done. So I can I can step over things here. This is great. I mean, I love this. It's just like debugging a PC application. You can inspect variables, memory, everything, even you know directly from the from the hardware. Really great stuff. So. I don't want to suspend it, I want to run it. So we'll resume F8 and it's continuing to run. And excellent, I can see here, yeah, I'll embed a picture in picture of this so you can see the LEDs cycling on the board. Um, it's obviously working, that's great. Um, so what I want to do now is check, uh, I can see the LEDs are working, but I want to check that the serial's working. So I'm going to open the serial terminal that I use here on Windows. It's real term, um, so just a free open source thing, it's very nice basic but you know it works so we'll go to port and the port i want is port one i actually have a physical um serial port it's not port one and it's this one it's always a high number for these virtual ones 
So there's port 10. We want a board rate of 115, 200, and we should go change. And ah, fantastic. So once per second, we're getting the output that we expect from the CH340. And that proves to me that the um, interface is working nicely. I've, I've been able to set board rates uh, correctly on both sides, on the user art and on the CH340's USB interface. Um, and I can connect to it and read out data. I'm just going to assume that TX is working because if RX is working, TX probably will as well. So that's that's great stuff. Uh, what I'll do now is go on. I'm not going to I'm not going to go any further with this uh, with this video and the software configuration. I'll I'll go and do some messing around with my Raspberry Pi and see if I can connect up the board to the Pi and get it uh, get it working there because ultimately a lot of my MCU boards are going to be connected to a Pi. So I want I want it to work uh, with Linux. And I have this feeling that the CH340 drivers on Linux are going to give me a bit of grief. I know the CH341 is supported, but I'm going to probably have a bit of fun with the CH340. But you can read about that in my blog. And, and if I come into any problems and there's any recommendations that I have for setting up the drivers on a Pi for the CH340, I'll document it there. So I think we're done here. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, I certainly have. And uh, I'll just sign off and say goodbye now.